The message is entitled, Don't Give Up on Your Seed Too Soon. Don't give up on your seed too soon. Genesis chapter 8 verse 22 says these words, As long as the earth endures seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Seed time and harvest until the earth no longer exists. Paul put it this way in Galatians 6, 9, and let us not be weary in doing well for in due season. Say that with me. For in due season, we shall reap if we don't faint. Man, I love these scriptures because when you read the Bible, you can see the many attributes of God and who he is. You see that he's love, that he's goodness, that he's faithfulness, that he is mighty and powerful. You read about his mercy that endures forever, his loving kindness, his grace that is greater than any sin or any situation, that he is ever present no matter what you're facing or going through, that he never leaves you and he never forsakes you, that he is committed to you, that he is with you. He is your front guard and your rear guard and the glory in the midst. And he is greater in you than he that's in the world. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not lie. He does does not change. He is the same as he will always be. We can go on and on about who God is, and we still can never fully grasp him. He is beyond all that we know. But there is one thing that we do know. God operates on principles, on spiritual laws. God is someone that you can count on that when he gives a principle, he fulfills what he has promised. One of those principles is the principle of tithing. It is a spiritual principle. Malachi chapter three says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out on you a blessing until it overflows, then I'll rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor your vine in the fields cast off grapes, says the Lord of hosts. All the nations will call you blessed and you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. The spiritual principle is this, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Now, some of you are going, great. You're gonna do a message on money. No, I'm not. This is not about money. This is far bigger than that and far greater than that. But I wanna use that as a backdrop. You know why? Because we don't fully believe this as so many times. God says, the whole tithe to the storehouse, I will open the windows of heaven. I will pour out a blessing too big to handle. In fact, the Hebrew, it literally means, I will give to you fully, not holding back. How many like God to give you fully more than you could imagine? In the Syriac, which is the language the early church used, but it's no longer present today, it literally means until you say, it is enough. I don't know about you, but that's a lot. Where you say, God, you bless me so much, it's enough right now. You can, you can keep it. You can hold it right now. It's enough. The Bible says that, that he will prevent the enemy from devouring your possessions, your finances, your family, your children, your peace. How many of you would like that principle to operate in your life? God does things through principles, through spiritual principles in order, in order to bless you. However, there are conditions 
There are conditions to operating and, and walking in this. Let me give you three for the principle of tithing. You say, wait a second, I only see one. Bring the whole tithe. No, there are three conditions. Let me show you. First of all is the condition of faith. You have to have faith. You must have faith concerning what God has promised. Every promise requires faith. Every promise from salvation to every promise to you as a Christ follower. You must live in faith, stand in faith, pray in faith, speak in faith, worship in faith, shout in faith, resist the enemy in faith, advance in faith, sow in faith, and expect a harvest in faith. If you do not believe that God operates by established principles and that he is God of his word, if you will not trust him enough, you won't bring the whole tithe. It takes faith. You have to believe before receiving. You have to trust before outpouring. And that's why so many don't bring the tithe. They don't truly believe in the principle that God established. My dad attended this church when I was younger, and he did not serve the Lord. We had a divided home in our family. But my dad was an average salesman in his, in his business when I was growing up. Somehow, some way, my mom talked, her into tithing, talked him into tithing. I don't know how she did it, but she prayed and said, God, we need to tithe. So my dad began to write 10% out of everything he earned and gave it to the Lord. And one day my dad said to me, he said, son, I can't explain this. I don't get it. I don't understand it. But we have more on 90% than we do on 100%. And my dad moved from mediocre or middle to the number one salesperson in his company. You know why? Because God honors the principles that he has established. Second thing you need to know is it's an if and then condition. If you do this, I'll do this. Chronicles, Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their land and their sin and heal them. If and then. Oh, my friend, listen to me. We have to understand that if we bring the whole tithe, not half or part, we bring the whole tithe, then God says, I will do my part. I will open the heavens. I will rebuke the devourer. I will show the world how marvelous I am and how extravagant I am. God loves to show his grace and favor through his people. He loves it. If and then. You have to have faith. If you bring it, not 2%, not 5%, not 8%, but the whole tithe, he said, I'll do this for you. The last condition is patience. God never gives a timeline when the blessings will come. He never marks it on a calendar and said, this is the date you can expect it, that I'll fling open everything. But we have a timeline. We're the ones that say, God, if you don't do it now, if it doesn't happen in my timing, on the date, the time, the amount, then God, I'm not going to continue trusting you. Hebrews 6.12 says that we are imitators of those through faith and patience inherit the promises through faith and patience. There are promises that God has made to you that you have to stand your ground and stand in faith and wait on God to step into the situation. You see, you don't see what's happening behind the scenes. You don't see what God is doing behind the scenes. But at the right time, at the right moment, when we wait patiently, God answers our cries. Hebrews 6.15 says that Abraham waited patiently and he received what had God had promised. Faith, if then, patience. That's all part of seed time 
and harvest. You see, God told this to Noah after the flood took place. And I believe God did because he wanted to encourage him and wanted to declare, just as you see the rainbow, that the rainbow declares, I will never flood the earth again. Seed time and harvest is God's promise that this will work and operate no matter what happens and will never cease. Sowing and reaping. It applies in every area of your life. In fact, every day you are planting seeds and whatever seeds you are planting will be your harvest. Let me explain what I mean. There's a few things that I believe God wants you to get in your heart. I believe if you will understand this and you will embrace it, you'll begin to see Harvest like you've never seen. In your personal life, in your family life, in your marriage, in your kids, I believe that if you will understand this, it will change your trajectory. Are you still with me so far? The first is this. The seeds that you plant are the crops you reap. The seeds you plant are the crops you reap. Growing up, I grew up uh, near Lower Sacramento Road where Corbin Lane intersected with Lower Sac and behind us, there was a canal. You could go past our fence, there would be a levee and there was a canal there and we would swim in that and we'd float down the canal because there would be blackberry bushes. Man, we'd go out there and pick those blackberries and just take a bucket and float down there and just pick them. And my mom would, she would preserve them. She'd make a pie out of them. She would, she'd do amazing things with blackberries. But growing up, my parents decided they were going to plant a garden on the other side of the fence. We had a gap that was there before we got to the levee. So... We tilled the ground, we prepared the ground, we got it ready, and my mom and dad would plant tomatoes, green beans, corn, okra, squash. I was okay with the tomatoes and the green beans and the corn, but I hated okra and squash. Oh, come on, have you ever eaten boiled okra? It slides from your tongue all the way down to your stomach before it ever releases from your tongue. It's just slimy. It's just ungodly. I had no desire to eat these ungodly vegetables. In fact, I dreaded the day that these crops would begin to push up from the ground. I'd pray for the green beans and the corn and that, but I would speak against the other crops. I enjoyed some of them, but I hated others of them. Some of you have been planting seeds, sowing seeds of love and forgiveness, kindness and mercy, tithing and generosity, patience and gentleness, blessing and encouragement. And you're starting to see them push up a little bit. And you're going, God, what might be? There are others, though, that are sowing anger and bitterness, criticism, complaining, fear, frustration, greed, lust, selfishness, and pride. And these crops are not enjoyable at all. They're bitter to the taste. They are painful to your spiritual digestion system. But the seeds you plant are the crops you reap. You have to understand that every day you have seed in your hands and God has harvest in his. 
You have seeds that you are every day choosing what you're going to plant and how you're going to respond to what's going on around you. I know that there are husbands and wives that will say, well, if he starts doing it, then I'll start doing it. Or if she starts being this way, then I'll start being this way. That's not how it works. You have to plant the seed of what the crop is that you want and say, God, I'm planting forgiveness. I'm planting in encouragement. I'm planting blessing. I'm planting words of kindness, God. I'm planting what is the crop I want. It's a principle. And some, you're planting seed expecting something else. What this community needs, what we need are people that understand that what I plant will give birth, it will grow, and it will grow up. And one day you have to partake of it. And just like okra and squash, my dad used to make me sit at the table and I would stare at it and he would say, you're not leaving until you eat it. It's terrible hot, but it's worse when it's cold. And I would try to figure out ways to remove it so that they wouldn't see it. Put it down my front part of my pants and say, I'm sorry, I have to use the restroom, Dad, sorry. But, but in life, you can't do that. You can't, what you sow, what you put in the ground, and that's why I want to encourage you today. Don't give up. Sow the right seed. Plant the right seed in the ground and watch what God will do. He does the supernatural. The second thing I want you to know is this. The amount of seed determines the size of your crops. You're like, oh, you came all that way to tell us that? It's important that you understand this is what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church of Corinth. He said in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly reaps sparingly. Whoever sows generously reaps generously. If you sow just a little, you're going to get just a, a little. If you sow a lot, you're going to get back a lot. The amount of your seed determines the size of your harvest in your family, in your relationships, in your marriage, in what you're doing. It matters. Some may get in your business a little bit. Paul said these in Galatia to the Galatia Christians, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever a man or a woman sows, this is what they will reap. We always look at it in such a negative light. We always look at it as like, oh, oh no, which you should. Because what you plant is what you reap, what you sow. If you sow hate, what are you going to get? You're going to get hate and arguments and anger back. If you sow love, you're going to get back love. If you sow generosity, if you sow, if you sow kindness, if you sow grace, if you sow mercy, you're going to get back the crop you're sowing. The word sow in this, in this particular verse is in the Greek not a single time sowing. It is a continual, habitual sowing of a particular seed. So in other words, whenever you continually sow, whatever you continually put out is what you're gonna get back in your life. That's why you have to really pay attention to what you're sowing. You have to pay attention to your attitude, to your words, to your spirit, to how you are addressing, how you're living, what you're doing, how you're treating people, how you're showing Christ or not showing him. It is a continual, habitual sowing. 
It could be more accurately translated, whoever sows and sows and sows and sows, it is a perpetual seed. Paul's saying, listen, I want to I wanna encourage you that whatever you perpetually sow is going to spring up in your life. If you sow, it applies to love, to work, to mercy, to patience, to forgiveness, to finances, to generosity, to kindness. It applies to all of that. See, what the world wants to see today is not what you believe, but how you live. They don't care what you believe. What they care about is, are you like Jesus? Because the Bible tells us that we are to become like his son. Do you know why they called them Christians in the book of Acts? Because that meant little Christ. They saw them behaving in such a way. They said that they're acting like Jesus, and it shook the world. Whatever seed you plant. Conversely, it applies to bitterness, anger, selfishness, jealousy, criticism, gossip, lust. There's no exception to this principle. Whatever you sow, regardless of what it is, will become your harvest. It'll become what you see around you. Additionally, Paul wrote the word reap. It's in the same tense. It's future. It's, it's present future. It's, it's moving forward. It means to reap and reap and reap and reap. Those two words, sow and reap, are filled with incredible potential. Do you understand, church, that those, world, those words, that what God is saying is that if you will sow the right kinds of seed, you're going to get back to you incredible blessings. However, the Paul, Paul uses the additional word, will. They will reap. It is fixed, future fixed. Harvest is coming. It's coming your way. The good news is that you can begin to plant the right seed. You can begin to say, God, what I have been planting, maybe it's the way you were raised. Maybe it's the, the events that have happened in your life. Maybe it's the things that people did to you and you said, never again. It's not going to happen. I'm going to draw a line and so I'm going to attack first instead of being attacked. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to act first before they ever do to me. You see, when you plant a seed or seeds... That's when the enemy begins to put pressure. That's when he begins to work. If we don't give up. Let me finish with this. Are you still with me so far? I know you're all going, man, I was hoping Pastor Damien was preaching today. Man, that dude, he can bring it. Yes, he can. But I want you to know he's not bringing it out of his natural self. He's bringing it out of the Spirit of God that's inside of him and speaking. That's why we never worship people. I never put them on pedestals. You know why? Because when you elevate somebody on a pedestal, God has no choice but to begin to bring them down because he will have no other person steal his glory. No other person. Don't elevate your pastor, elevate Jesus. Don't elevate your worship team, elevate Jesus. Don't lift them up, don't lift them up in what they're doing. Elevate Jesus, you know why? Because he is the one, he's the one. But what I love about him is he says, when he was here, he goes, I'm the light of the world. And then he said, no, now you're the light of the world. Let your light shine brightly and says, let people see your good works so that they may glorify your heavenly father. That's what we do. That's why we plant the right seed. That's why we say the right words. That's why we we declare and believe God and begin to say, no matter what we see, we don't curse the darkness, we bless. We We don't just criticize people. We pray for them and say, oh God, open their eyes and let them see that there is a better way and there is a life that can be transformed and changed. 
So let me finish with this. You need to stay the course of continually sowing the right seed and never give up. Galatians 6, 9, let us not grow weary in doing well. Doing well. I want you to hear me. Those words mean something. Doing well. The Bible calls them good deeds. The Bible calls them showing forth the good deeds of God. When you begin to operate that way, people begin to go, oh, that's what Jesus is like. I want that, Jesus. Oh, man, it's so easy to sow bad seed. But this is, a, this is so important. You need to hear this. The word faint means to loosen or relax your grip. In other words, you've been sowing good seed and you just, the enemy begins to come against you and go, it never worked. Nothing's changing. Why are you still doing that? Why are you still blessing them? Why are you start, still speaking kindly? Why are you still, still doing this? It's not working. You know why he does that? He wants you to loosen your grip of faith and faint and step back and go, I guess God doesn't care about me. Guess he doesn't want to answer my prayers. I guess I'm not on his good list. I guess, you know, there's stuff in your life, you know, that, that really, you know what you thought the other day, or you know how you spoke the other day, or you know how you were the other day. God's not going to deal, he's not going to answer that. He's not going to bless you. And then they'll start pointing people out in the church and go, look at them, they look so blessed. Look at them, they look like God's really doing things in, in, in a great way. Look at you. How many have ever played tug of war? Anybody ever had a, had played tug of war before? Man, tug of war, it is a brutal game of competition. Have a rope with usually something tied in the middle that, that shows where the middle of, of the two sides are. And generally they'll have like mud or, you know, or dirt or something, you know, and you're trying to pull your opponents into that that junk and win by pulling on the rope and tug of war man when you line up everybody's lining up and most of the time in tug of war you try to find the the strongest the biggest even maybe the heaviest and put them on the back you know just wrap it around you hold your hold it the thing about tug of war is tug of war is is really not just about strength alone. It's really a lot about grip. Because when you're pulling and you have this pressure, you know, you, you discover if I can get lower and I can really just pull this thing and you're trying to pull this back and your legs start burning and all that. But how many know your leg muscles are far bigger than your, your grip muscles? And so you're down there and you're just pulling and all of a sudden, you know, your hands are just starting to go, ugh. They get tired, they're burning right here. And then pretty soon, what happens is depending on the strength of the group or how in shape maybe your side is, I don't know, there's a release or you get pulled into the junk. Paul is trying to give us a picture that in life, that we are in a tug of war. The enemy is trying everything to do he, that he can do to get us to loosen our grip of faith in who God is, his faithfulness, his goodness, his promises, who he, how he acts, what he does. And he tries to get us to loosen our faith in those times where we've been planting seed and putting it in the ground. We've been bringing our whole tithe. We've been saying these things that bless. We've been, we've been doing these, planting the right seeds and the enemy's right there whispering in our ear going, it's not working. God's not gonna do that. You should give up on your faith. You should not, you shouldn't keep doing this. It's, it's not working for you. It's not going to change anything. God's not, he's not really there. And he says that to you. You know why? Because you don't see what he sees behind you. You see, the one that's behind you is 
the Lord Jesus Christ and he's got a hold of the back of the rope. And he's standing there holding it and going, it don't matter how hard he pulls, you just need to know something, you're not losing. It doesn't matter because you know why? Because I am standing back here holding on. What I need you to do is to stay with me, to trust me, to believe me, to know that when you sow a seed, the harvest is going to come and it's going to have my blessing on it. It's going to have my goodness on it. It's going to have my grace on it. It's going to have my life on it. You're going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. When you plant a seed, the enemy is saying, give up, quit. It doesn't work. God doesn't care. Your finances are never going to get better. Your relationship is never going to be stored. Your marriage is never going to be healed. That promotion will never come. You'll never be married. I believe that God, man, wanted me to bring this word to you on purpose. And I'll tell you why. Some of you have already, you're about to faint. You're going, God, what, why, why is it not changing? Why is it not different? Why is it not? And God's going, trust me. Believe me. Declare what I said. Stand up. And when the enemy goes, it's not working, you stand up and go, oh God, is it a God that doesn't lie? And that he watches over his word and he says, I'm gonna make sure it does what I said it would do and it's not gonna come back void. You you stand on that in my name and watch what I do. Oh, the enemy's saying, I'll never get well, I'll never be healed, it'll never change. No, 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 I stand on the word in Psalm 103 that says, blessed be the Lord my God. He is the one that heals all of my diseases I trust him you see church what the enemy wants to do is to say you can plant the wrong seed and still get blessing you can plant the wrong seed and still see things go the right way no I'm here to declare today it is time for century assembly and those that call this place their home to rise up in the name of Jesus and say wherever I go no matter what I do I represent the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and I'm going to treat my spouse the right way. I'm going to treat my kids the right way. I'm going to treat my fellow businessmen the right way. I'm going to plant seeds that are going to glorify God. Don't grow weary and give up. Some of you are right on the verge of a miracle. Some of you have been praying for a kid that's away from God. My mom prayed five years for me to come to Christ. And I got worse. I want you to hear me. Sometimes what you pray for, things get worse. You know why? Because the enemy's putting pressure. He's at work trying to get you discouraged to go, see, your prayers don't work. They don't change anything. They don't make a difference. See, it's not working. My mom for five years was on her knees going, devil, you can't have my boy. I dedicated him to Jesus when he was a baby and he belongs to you, God. You can't have him. And I got worse and worse and worse and worse. And until one day I'm walking down a sidewalk stoned out of my mind and Jesus shows up and whispers to me and says, aren't you sick of this? <laughs> yes, I am, but I can't quit. Don't worry about that, give me your life. No, 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 you don't understand Jesus. I can't quit, but don't worry about it, give me your life. I can't quit, don't worry, give me your life, okay. Here it is, and instantly, five years of prayer, bam, delivered, set free. God put me back in my right mind. Mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, don't you dare listen to that liar that says your prayers don't work because the Bible says the prayers of the righteous are powerful and they are effective. You say, but pastor, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not righteous. Yes, you are. It's not about what you do. It's about what he's done. That I stand in the blood wash 
forgiveness of Jesus Christ and I have been cleansed, I have been forgiven, I have been seated in heavenly places and I belong to Him. I am adopted, I'm a child of God, Jesus and I are family. No one else is blessed, I am. Let me finish with this. Thank you, Pastor Damon, for letting me stand here today. It means a lot. And I want you to know, you and Stacy, you have somebody that's in your corner. I believe in you. Not only believe in you, I believe that God put a word on my heart for you. And this is why I kept wrestling because Hosea 2 says the, the latter glory of this house will be greater than the former. Just, uh, just hear me. The enemy is first assembly as it began and God began to send a move of God in that church and begin to grow and outgrow what we were God on purpose planted us here and there was a move of God I still remember sitting up there many times not because I was hiding out but because I couldn't sit closer and the enemy doesn't want a light in this community. He doesn't want lights running around in this community. So what does he do? He divides. He, he knows, listen, we are stronger together. We have power together. We have authority. There's something about unity. Go to the book of Acts that they were in accord in those 10 days and the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. You see, the enemy hates unity. He hates when church comes together as the body of Christ and says, we are family. We belong to the same family. And because you're family, I'm not speaking against you. I'm not, I'm not speaking harsh things about you. I'm not judging. I've got mercy mercy. I've got grace. I've got love. I've got, I've got, I've got inside of me, this heart that says, I'm going to pray for you and believe God for you. But the enemy knows that his greatest work is to divide. If I can divide and he does it under the cloud of spirituality, we're spiritual. You're not, we know God and we, we just no, we know God. I believe that what God is doing right now in this place is he's preparing for seed that has been sown. The enemy threw in some bad seed and said, I'm going to try to stop this. I'm going to throw in some other kind of seed. And, you know, isn't it funny that weeds grow faster than crops do? I mean, they just spread like crazy. Oh, man. But... They start springing up. God is going to bring fruit and harvest to what has been good soil and been planted here. And I believe that you are going to see the glory of the Lord manifested in this house and that people that have walked away, that have run away, that have disconnected and others that have stood out on the sideline hearing all kinds of stuff that God's going to heal this church. God's going to heal because what has been sown is going to come to pass. It's going to happen to the glory of God. And I, this is what I say to you. This is what I say to you. Is that you have a part of that. And that's why I'm going to tell you right now. What you plant makes a difference. What you plant here where you're seated. In your home. In your life. In this house makes a difference. And I think we need to declare to every principality and every power that we are the church of the living God and that we will not 
We will not allow a harvest to come that will divide. We are planting a harvest of grace and forgiveness and mercy and confession and, and humility. And we are going to stand in the name of Jesus and declare to the enemy, you thought that our better days were over. You have no idea what's about to come. We're about to see the wind of the Holy Spirit come into this house and begin to do a supernatural work that will rock this place and it will call to those that are that are lost those that are are people that have been away from God and call them back and we'll begin to see people's lives healed delivered set free transformed and trophies of him and his glory Won't you hear me if you think I'm standing up here to cast dispersions on individuals, I'm here to cast dispersion on the enemy and what he does. It's time to get ready. It's time to not loosen our grip of faith and say, God, we're believing. We're not praying less, we're praying more. We're not giving less, we're giving more. We're not, we're not loving less, we're loving extravagantly. We're not, we're not just here to get something from you. We wanna walk into the house every time and go, where can I plant more seed? Where can I plant more grace? Where can I plant more love? Where can I plant more hope? Where can I plant more of Jesus' love? Somebody walks through this door, they ought to be swarmed by such love that they just are overwhelmed and think you're a cult. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. That they think they don't even know me. How can they? And not one time, but every time. Just love them extravagantly. Love them generously. Bless them. Pray for them. It all starts with you. I believe there are some people you need to repent and say, God, I've been sowing some bad seed. I don't want that crop. The good news is this, God knows how. He knows how to rip the crop up and start a new one that you plant and watch it come up. We need to say, oh God, seed time and harvest. I believe it. And I'm going to start living it. I'm going to start doing it. And if nobody else is, I'm going to keep doing it. You know why? Because I know who you are. You're the God of your word. We're going to sow seed. Sow seed. Honor, mercy, compassion, encouragement. The Bible says, let's encourage one another as they're still today. Who have you encouraged today? Who have you blessed today? Who have you looked in the eyes and said, hey man, I love you. Let's get some coffee. There we go. You're bringing them up young. <laughs> Coffee. Woo. You're sowing good seed. You're the guy for this hour. You're the couple for this hour. Don't. Don't get in a hurry, but press in. Don't get nervous and go, God, win, win, win. Uh-uh. Faith is the substance of things hoped for without any evidence at all. As you are standing up here declaring these things, you know what we're doing? We're in the spirit. We're declaring what Jesus has already promised, what the word has already said, what God already wants to do. Today's the day. Don't open your mouth with curses. Don't open your mouth with doubts and unbelief. You see, if the devil gives you a shovel to dig up your doubt, don't grab it from him. 
turn and say, God, I trust you. I believe you. I trust in you. Everything in your hand is seed. Everything in his hand is harvest.